month with the core. Um, today, Huyen Roy is speaking about pig microgels as cytoskeleton sensors. Sorry, I'm messing this up. <laughs> That's fine. And modular 3D <laughs> cells now. Yeah. So um, you can see the rest of the schedule for lunch with the core on our website. Um, we are running lunch with the core pretty much every week between now and Thanksgiving. Um, and so hopefully we start having pizza tomorrow on time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn, for inviting me to talk here. Um, so today I'll talk about the research I've been doing this last few years. Uh, this is a good practice run for my prelim, so uh, it's a very good timing for me. Um, so I'll talk about this PEG microgels used as cytokine sensors, and also there's another part of the project where I use them as a pure cell scaffold. scaffold. Um, and as you can see by using the LSM-8 data here, you can get some very pretty images. I know. Maybe they want me to plug the uh, facility of it. So as I go through it and every device I use, I'll let you guys know um, and how you guys, if you guys have any questions about it. Maybe you can ask me, but probably Glenn or Austin will know better. Um, yeah. So why do we want to start uh, using 3D cell culture? Um, Compared to 2D cell culture, 3D cell culture can impact uh, the cell proliferation, differentiation, mechanical responses, and cell survival. As you can see in this image here, the 2D cell is very free to move around. There's no real uh, pressure coming from all three dimensions. Um, it can only have adhesions on one part of the cell. So it's not very biologically relevant. Maybe for skin it is, but every other organ system as in vivo replicable, I guess. Uh, while when you use a 3D system, um, you can have this adhesion sites all around the cell to replicate more the in vivo environment. Um, and also, the, just the sheer phenotype of the cell varies a lot between 2D and 3D. I don't know if you guys have ever seen any images of 3D encapsulated cells. Uh, at the start, they'll be very round, and then as they're able to stretch, they, they will start having more of a stretched uh, morphology, but still very different from 2D. 2D is just stretch as much as you can, right? Um, and as I said, they will have a better representation of in vivo environments. And uh, for 3D cell culture, cell-derived matrices are commonly used. Uh, but these are heterogeneous and not very tunable. So what can we do about that? Um, so for that, we can start using uh, more versatile tools such as polyethylene glycol. There's other types like uh, polyacrylamide, uh, any other kind of synthetic system. Um, so why I chose polyethylene glycol specifically, it's because it's a biocompatible polymer. Oh, by the way, if you guys have any questions, uh, never mind, it's pretty big. Also, so for small groups, I'll take questions in between. But um, So yeah, it's a biocompatible polymer. Uh, it's highly non-fouling. So as you can see in this image here, uh, an implant surface with the peg chains uh, can easily repel all kinds of protein absorption, uh, cell adhesion that you don't want on it. And also, it's uh, very versatile and well-defined. Uh, so as you can see in this uh, figure here, you can just buy this with the R being any functionality that you want. Not any, but like most functionalities that you'll need for common reactions. They'll sell them, so you can just buy them, use them. It's very plug and play, so it's very easy to use. And other uh, very important advantages of it is that it's non-toxic, non-immunogenic, non-antigenic, mostly uh, stemming from this non-fouling uh, property. It's highly water soluble and uh, very importantly for anyone that actually wants to create a product, it's FDA approved. So it has a lot of advantages compared to using uh, cell derived matrices such as matrigel or uh, collagen or um, yeah, yeah, so some other uh, polymers that might not be FDA approved yet. So how do we create uh, PEG hydrogels? Uh, hydrogels are basically created by creating some sort of mesh using these monomers. Uh, so 
as you can see here, this is called a chain growth reaction. So you have your peg polymer chains, and it will create a cross-linking between the different monomers. So each line is a monomer, basically. And as it forms this cross-linking, uh, it will create a mesh. And that, basically, when it becomes, uh, since the molecule itself is hydrophilic, you add some water on it, it will be a hydrogel. Um, and if you want a more orderly uh, nanostructure, you can use a step growth system. So this one, you can kind of see it as uh, inverted. So basically, the brown is now the uh, peg. And then the, uh, the blue can be the crosslinker. So you add some type of crosslinker that only reacts once with the uh, functionality at the edge of the uh, forearm monomer. And then those will start crosslinking together and then form a very structured uh, hydrogel. And these are called step growth. And uh, they included this example of doing both. Uh, I, I don't do that, so I don't really care. Um, and some of the common reactions include uh, radical induced acrylate. So this would be radical, uh, an example of radical induced acrylate uh, hydrogel. It can be thiol malamide, uh, radical induced thiol norbornin. These are very specific uh, reactions. So the thiol will only react with malamide once, and the thiol will only react with norbornin once. So with that, you can create this uh, step growth system. And there's other systems such as diboazide and HSS teramine, which will also create the step growth hydrogel. Um, so yeah, I was just trying to show you how uh, hydrogels are made. And PEC hydrogels have already been used since what, 20 years ago uh, to culture 3D, uh, to culture cells in 3D. So as you can see here, uh, these are, I think it's like fibrin clots. Yeah, they are fibrin. And then they encapsulate it in uh, adhesive and degradable uh, hydrogel, uh, PEG hydrogels, by adding MMP, MMP is uh, matrix remodeling proteins. So they add MMP sensitive crosslinkers in between the monomers of PEG. So if the cells start releasing uh, the MMP, the monomers will get cleaved out and there will be degradation of the hydrogel. So it's a very cell directed degradation and they use that gel to encapsulate these uh, clots. And you can see how the cells start growing outwards from it. Um, and this is just like a close-up image of that. And depending how you tune your hydrogel, you can really change uh, the morphology of the cell and how they survive. So the least degradable type of gel that they use here, you can see that the cells are still pretty uh, rounded. But as they increase the degradability, um, they see that the cells are spreading more. And then once they get rid of the adhesion sites, also the cells start getting more rounded. So it's an intermix of tuning, uh, degradation, and um, adhesiveness. And then there's other stuff that you can tune thanks to it being such a versatile tool. I'll go through that. Uh, so going more into the future, using the, those uh, PEG hydrogel, bulk encapsulating hydrogels. Uh, this microgel technology has uh, come up very recently, I think in the last 10 years at least. Um, and these are basically little hydrogels in the, si in the micrometer range. Uh, I think for this experiment, these people had around 100 micrometer uh, microgels. And the 3D cell culture using these microgels the cells are able to spread much more uh, because they don't have to degrade stuff to get there. They, they can just reach out and start spreading. And also with the microgel technology, uh, yeah, you, you can like start mixing different microgel types into one system. As you can see here, you can layer uh, your microgels in a syringe. And then once, once you inject it, you can have your different three layers of microgel type. So depending what your use is, this is a very versatile tool, again. Um, and yeah, um, one of the main advantages, advantages is that the cells are not restricted uh, anymore in that encapsulation, but they're still in that 3D system where they're interacting with other cells. Uh, 
the microgels can increase free diffusion. So as I said, because it's free space, basically. Um, and this is very important for stains. Uh, I had a lot of trouble, I had worked with encapsulating gels before, and those, uh, there's a lot of problems with trying to use antibody stains for the cells. So something like this, where the antibodies won't have issue diffusing, diffusing through, uh, it would be very advantageous. And as I also mentioned, microgels allow for uh, having different types of microgels in one system. Uh, so some of the applications of microgels I'll talk about are this uh, 3D in situ cytokine sensor. Uh, I'm using uh, hepatic stellate cells. These are cells uh, active in fibrosis in the liver. I won't really go through the biology, but uh, I made the sensors capture uh, the cytokine called IL-6. And you can see that gradient being formed here. And also, another system that you can think of using the microgels is this modular 3D cell culture scaffold. So kind of similar to what came before, but now we're actually imparting some kind of bioactive uh, uh, ECM onto it. And these are also HSCs being attached to the microgels. So first, I'll go through the 3D in situ cytokine sensors. Uh, I'll, I'll play the video after because it's distracting. Uh, so right now, there's not real techniques to visualize cell-secreted proteins in three-dimensional space. There's a lot of uh, capturing the cell in micro droplets and then measuring within that droplet, the concentration within that droplet. But it doesn't really give you a spatial sense of it, right? You're just grabbing a single cell onto a droplet and capturing. Or you have a light spot, which gives you a quantitative analysis, uh, not, not quantitative, qualitative analysis that this cell is secreting, this cell is not. But it's not giving you quantitative how much is it secreting. So there are techniques out there to measure single cell or clump of cells secretion, but it's not really, you can't really define it in 3D. Uh, yeah, as I said, most techniques focus on bulk liquid measurements. Um, and since now there's an increasing number of 3D in vitro experiments, a system where you can capture this uh, cytokine and analyze it would become more and more useful. Uh, so the system is that you have your microgels basically in green, all the microgels. And then the purple here is the captured IL-6 being detected through antibody. Um, so yeah, I just thought it was a pretty video that you can also take at LSM-880 using Maris to analyze. You can take videos like this using it. So a lot of tools at IGB uh, to achieve your goals. Um, so I, I <laughs> denominated my technique microgel ELISA, a microgel linked immunosorbent assay. So it's very similar to sandwich ELISA. Uh, just you're doing it in a very small microgel, giving it that much more surface area in 3D space rather than just restricting it to a single surface on the bottom. Uh, so the basic system is uh, you use 4M peg acrylate and biotin peg acrylate. Uh, so the acrylates will come together and stochastically, well, let, let me go through this. So you mix these three things together, the fully initiated biotin peg acrylate, 4M peg acrylate together. Um, and when you put dextrin magnesium sulfate solution, the dextrin and the peg will separate. And when you vortex it, uh, you'll form little micro droplets. So this is very similar to water and oil. It's just you're using both of them as aqueous solutions rather than having to rely on using oil, mineral oil. Um, yeah, once you vortex it, you form your micro droplets, you expose them with UV. The photo initiator will start a reaction with the acrylates, and the acrylates will come together and will become a chain growth system. And by chance, you will have some biotin sticking out. Uh, I say by chance, but that you, you will have. Uh, and then you add some streptavidin. You incubate this microgels with streptavidin and streptavidin 647, and you basically end up with the uh, microgels fluorescing, giving you the crescent of microgel, basically. And then you add your biotinylated IL-6 antibody uh, that will bind to the streptavidin. 
and then either you culture this with steroids or just add media with IL-6 uh, and then let them uh, start capturing the IL-6. Uh, so now the IL-6 is captured into that antibody and then you just do your sandwich ELISA to fix your uh, cells, put your uh, antibody, capture antibody and then uh, detection antibody. And yeah, you do end up with fluorescence related to the capture of IL-6. Uh, the system that I use is this microwell system. Uh, so this is already very tiny. Uh, it's one of those A12 EVD slides. I don't know if you guys have used one, but uh, this is like the size of one slide. And then within one of the wells, I have little microwells. Uh, this helps capture the microwells without them just floating around, right? Whenever you do perform a wash, if you don't have this kind of very tight uh, volumes, the microgels will float out. So this is just a way to secure your microgels in place. Uh, so first result that I'll show you is that the microgel assay can actually detect IL-6. Uh, so the, as I said, the green uh, is just the surpatidin 647. And then uh, by adding all the components that I mentioned, you can detect IL-6 in purple. But as you can see here, the fluorescence is very heterogeneous in the sense that some microgels seem like they're fluorescing, some microgels are not. So I went to, oh, before I go to that, this is just the microgel diameter that you get out of this. So they're very tiny, uh, they're less than cell size, but uh, not anything that you would be worried about going into the cells. Uh, and also it's PET, so it won't interact with the cell. So going through the optimization, uh, just by varying streptavian concentration and biotin peg acrylic concentration, uh, of course you're gonna have some dimming of the fluorescence, but you can see going from the left to the right here, I, I do start seeing uh, all the microgels fluorescing rather than uh, like half or a few. Uh, yeah. And I kind of settled on, on like between these two. So it's actually, so this is like, um, yeah, whatever concentration I use is half of this too. If you guys are interested in the concentration, I can let you guys know after. Um, and this microgelizer system can actually detect different concentration of IL-6. So this IL-6 was added as just pure bulk media IL-6. So this is not self-secreted IL-6, but you can still see that as I increase the IL-6 concentration and the media, uh, I increase the detection too of that. Um, and I went through, I measured basically the intensity of the whole slab of microgels and uh, fit that into a four parameter logistic regression. And then that can give you uh, this equation for intensity, intensity based on the IL-6 concentration. And then you can use that equation to just whatever intensity you get, you fit it into that equation and get your concentration, IL-6 concentration. So that's what I tried to do here. Uh, so first, let's try to detect some self-secreted IL-6 instead of relying on the recombinant IL-6 that you just buy. So uh, I knocked down, by using siRNA, the IL-6 on some of the hepatic stellate cells and not on some. I have some negative control on some of them. And you can see that uh, the ones that were knocked down on IL-6, you have no more detection or less detection of the IL-6, which is the result that we wanted. Um, and this profile, like this gradient, can be fit into a calculated IL-6 concentration radial profile. So as I said, I, I start with the intensity, but then using that intensity equation, I'm able to get this calculated concentration uh, profile. And uh, very clearly the knockdowns are lower secretion compared to the negative control. Uh, so that's a very good result for that. And also another thing you can do um, is you grab the first, I mean you can go as far as you want, but what I did is I grabbed this first 150 micrometers and then basically change concentration into uh, absolute number, absolute 
mass of IL-6 that's captured within this uh, volume. So basically just multiply concentration by volume. Uh, and then we're able to see also that difference where knockdown of 50 is very similar to uh, negative control of 10 cells. Uh, and of course, negative control of 50 cells has much higher secretion. Uh, there's some caveats to this that, uh, as you can see, it kind of tops off. I, I put the maximum limit of 22 uh, nanograms per milliliter because I just didn't think it was reliable after that. This is like the 80% mid-range, so it's actually the 90% from the top. Uh, so, yeah. So, of course, this could be higher, but using that uh, threshold, this is, the this is the mass of IL-6 that I got within the system. And not just uh, hepatic stellate cells, it can also measure IL-6 secreted by other cells. Uh, so I did hep G2s, which are a very common uh, cancer, uh, hepatic cancer cell line. And this primary portal fibroblast that we had. And the hep G2s showed no detection of IL-6 being secreted. Um, that does correlate with uh, qPCR data, so this is actually a good thing. Not that it's not detecting Hep2 IL6 for some reason. And uh, as you can see, hepatic stellate cells that I had already showed you and portal fibroblast secreted IL6 has been captured and detected, and you can see that throughout uh, this radial profile. Uh, and not just cell spheroids. Uh, I performed another experiment just using single cells, and you can see the heterogeneity inherent on, uh, on, on your culture, cell, cell culture. Uh, each single cell has a different uh, release profile of the IL-6. Uh, this was quantified here in this histogram. And of course, they do center around a certain uh, amount of IL-6 secreted, but then you have these outliers that might be secreting more. So systems like this help you identify the heterogeneity in your culture system. Uh, and not just IL-6, I tried this with MMP2, which is another activation marker for hepatic stellate cells. And as you can see, there is presence of macrogels here, but no, not much detection. But as you increase the concentration of MMP2, you start seeing a higher intensity of detection. And if you realize the fit is much more wider, so this is just because my system was optimized for IL-6 detection. I, I bet if you optimize it for MMP2 uh, detection, you could get this at a lower concentration and at a wider range. And also self-secreted MMP2, you can see uh, differences in the uh, intensity depending on the size of the cell spheroid. So what's the potential of the system? Uh, of course, it's adaptable to different proteins and, multi and it has multiplexing possibilities. We saw that it can capture MP2 too, so if you optimize it for different types of proteins, you can see a system where you're capturing various kinds of uh, proteins at once, and then you can detect all the cell-secreted proteins in one system. Uh, you can spatially visualize the secretion. Uh, I specifically mentioned differentiating organoids. Um, of course, there are stains that you can just do within the cell, right? That are retained within the cell, and then you can use that as differentiation markers. But if you wanted to uh, actually measure secreted proteins too, you could use this system and see if a certain type of cell in a differentiating organoid is not releasing this type of uh, protein or it is. So the, it just adds on to uh, capabilities that we already have. And you can also see it being used in uh, in vivo research. I wouldn't put it in actual humans, like uh, mice. I think, I don't know what your ethical views are on that, but uh, in vivo research, I think it's uh, possible. And you can potentially think of having an injury site, you inject this microgels. Um, there's ways to anneal the microgels together, so you would definitely need to do that. Uh, anneal the microgels, capture whatever immune response that's happening to the cytokine, and then you would have to dissect it out and stain it. But um, 
it's another way of visualizing uh, immune response. So yeah, that's the end for the uh, in situ cytokine sensor system. And now I'll move on to the modular 3D cell culture scaffold. As we mentioned already, uh, conventional encapsulation techniques for 3D cell culture are very restrictive in the sense that cells are uh, very restricted to a space. Um, and these microgels allow uh, mix and matching of microenvironments. I'll go through that afterwards, but um, as, we as we said, you can have heterogeneous microgels into one system. You saw the beautiful video there. So it's very similar system. Uh, the differences are that now I'm using pegnorbormin. So this is a step growth uh, peg functionalization. Uh, I didn't use it because it was step growth. But, uh. So first what you do is you uh, link your proteins of interest with a thiol by using this SDA peg thiol. It has an NHS ester. So the NHS ester will react with any free lysines on the protein, and then you'll end up with free thiols. Um, and then you mix this thiolated protein with dithiol crosslinkers and photoinitiator with the norbornines. The norbornines, as I mentioned, react with thiols uh, very orthogonally. So you'll have one-to-one -one reaction there. And this is uh, radical induced, so you do the same vortex get your droplets and UV exposed. And then the dithiol crosslinkers will bring these monomers of PEG together, and you'll also have some of the proteins uh, linked, covalently linked to the uh, microgel. Uh, you may ask, why didn't I just use streptavidin and biotin chemistry? Uh, uh, biotin streptavidin interaction, as strong as it is, is not enough for cell adhesion. Like, it will adhere, but the pulling from the cell is actually higher than the stability of that bond. So you actually need the covalent bond to create the stable adhesion from the cell. And these microgels, I put them in the similar microwell system. Uh, I did this one as mostly microgels and a uh, smaller number of cells in terms of volume but you can see this being applied the other way where you just put more cells and less microgels and basically dope your spheroid system with certain types of ACM that you want. And this is just uh, some fluorescent images of those microgels. Um, so this, I actually didn't use uh, an ECM protein. I used just a fluorescent antibody, uh, but it went through the same chemistry. Uh, and as you can see, going through this same process, it creates this layer of uh, protein on the outside and on, on the core. Um, considering that the system that I want is a cell adhesion system, this is good that it's on the outer layer, right? That's where the cells will interact with. Um, and I performed some microgel stiffness measurements using AFM, and the diameter just by a bright field image and then analyze it. So the reduced Young's modulus for these microgels are an average of 10 kilopascals for the four, uh, this composition of the, of the microgel, which is 4 m peg at 4% weight per volume. Uh, and actually adding the protein, so no NP means no protein, C1 means I added collagen 1 as a protein. Uh, there is difference, and but it's not significant, um, but there's definitely a clear difference between the two. So I might need to be more aware of that in the future, but uh, as for the study, just assume that 4 and 4 percent are basically the same stiffness. And then 8 or 8 percent, this is, of course, uh, more cross-linking density, uh, more concentration, so you end up with a stiffer microgel. Uh, so this was around 35.26 kilopascals, 32.59 kilopascals of Young's modulus. And then the microgel diameter, there was also slight differences between the two, um, but in the grand scheme of things, it's very similar. <laughs> so now uh, we actually tried to culture some cells with the microgels, and then uh, you can see the 
microgels that didn't have any proteins attached to them, the cells just cluster with themselves and have zero interaction with the fake microgels. Uh, while if you add either fibronectin, collagen 1, collagen 3, collagen 4, these are all very common uh, GCM proteins, you can see that the cells are starting to interact more with the fake microgels and depending which protein you added, they have different interactions and different morphologies. Uh, so I just kind of separated the data for the no protein one because it's so different. Uh, so most of the data I'll show you from now on are focused on the adhesive proteins or the gels that do have protein. And as you can see, the uh, surface area to volume ratio is completely different for these two. Uh, yeah. And on the eight samples that we actually care about, uh, that uh, collagen four stiff uh, sample had the highest uh, surface area to volume ratio. If you look at the images, they don't quite look like it, right? They, they look like they're more clumpier than here. But you also have to consider that the cells are interacting with the microgel and then there might be some, like it's not all just encompass, right? There, there are some spaces of microgel are empty. So when the, that goes through the Imaris uh, analysis system, the microgel is also counted as a surface area. So that, that just, I, I, this is just a good indication that the cells are interacting more with the microgel than themselves. Uh, yeah, and maybe in this case it means that they're both interacting cell and microgel. So I also did some immunostains, immunostaining experiments with these four proteins. Uh, alphas, these are all hepatic stellate cell activation markers. And while we don't see much differences with the alpha smooth muscle actin, lysyl oxidase, uh, we do see some significant differences in collagen one expression and PDGFR beta expression. Uh, these are all intracellular measurements. Anything outside the cell boundary wasn't measured. So something like collagen one might not be the best uh, example of it, but uh, intracellular collagen one, you'll still be able to see quite well. Uh, but yeah, uh, it looked like collagen four, the stiff collagen four had the most uh, differential expression from the other three samples. And as you can see here, uh, stiff collagen one, so that's this one the lowest expression there. Uh, you don't see much collagen, and here uh, you do see much more in the collagen four, uh, stiff collagen four sample. And then the same for PDGFR beta, uh, stiff fibronectin, which is the highest. You see a low expression there, and a bit dimmer here on the uh, stiff collagen four. Uh, and of course the readouts are by nucleus, so these are more Even if you think uh, absolute uh, amount of fluorescence might be similar, these have more cells, so per nucleus is actually less. Uh, so there's a bunch of qPCR data, which I'll summarize it for you because no one wants to see that. Uh, so the ECM content of microgels uh, can modulate gene expression. So basically the same thing I did before, now at a bigger scale. So before I used microwaves, now I'm just using 384 well plates, uh, and then just doing qPCR on them. And these are uh, negative delta CT, so there's not like actual expression fold differences, it's just a logarithm. Does everyone know how they are working? Uh, it's DCT values. Um, and since it's negative, the higher means higher expression. So clearly, as we saw before in the immunostaining images, collagen four is actually uh, expressed more highly in the stiff collagen four uh, ECM environment. And PGF beta one, MMP two, PGFR beta, these were all samples that had quite a lot of variation. I excluded some of the ones that didn't show a lot of differences. Uh, but as you can see, there, there are some uh, significant differences being shown 
from these four different genes. Uh, and because I didn't want to show you all the ECM and stiffness combinations, I basically just combined all the ECMs and only isolated the stiffnesses here, so sub-stiff of the two different ones. And most of this, so these are all activation markers. And you can see most of them are increasing on the stiffer one, which is what is kind of known in the literature. Um, in some of the 2D experiments we've done, it's the opposite way. So this goes hand in hand with that idea that 3D systems might be able to replicate in vivo uh, environments better. So yeah, here, uh, alpha smooth muscle actin, CDH2, even though not significant, you can see everything is kind of leaning towards stiffer being higher expression. And, uh, collagen one, CDH alpha beta, baby cell were often immunostained twice. And using the qPCR data, we can uh, create this uh, principal component analysis uh, where we cluster the different types of cell cultured in the different uh, environments into different morphologies. So we're able to form three different clusters. Um, the collagen four and stiff collagen one tend to lean one way where it's high CDH2, high collagen one and uh, fibronectin and the soft versions of collagen one and collagen three uh, tend to be in this cluster and then uh, the stiff collagen three samples just have their own uh, morphology that they follow. Uh, so what's the other potential for this system? Uh, so <laughs> it's to recreate heterogeneous microenvironments. I didn't touch onto that with this experience because I'm not there yet. Uh, but we are planning experiments where we're just using liquid handlers to put these microgels at different ratios on a 384 well plate. Uh, and then we'll let the cells grow and then add this MMP2, so of course to analyze 384 with imaging, it's not very viable, right? So one way you can do it is just add this uh, substrate that gets cleaved by the presence of a protein and um, just, just read that out with a plate reader. So it's much more high throughput system. And you can do a lot of things like, uh, yeah, high throughput screening uh, of like differentiation, um, drug screening. And with these microgels, of course, you can create a wider array of relevant stiffnesses and ECM combinations. Uh, the, I do acknowledge that the 10 kilopascal is not great soft environment, uh, but you can see a future where we just keep modifying the components of the gel, uh, lower the stiffness, so it's more healthy organ stiffness. Uh, and not just ECM, you can attach any kind of thiolated protein or any molecule, it could be a drug, it could be anything that you, you can think of. Um, yeah, and as I said, you can mix and match them and then create different environments for whatever you're trying to study. Yeah. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, my whole lab. Uh, so three of them are here laughing at me the whole time. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, we haven't taken any recent pictures, so this guy has to be in his PJs and there's three people that are missing, and then these two are actually not here anymore. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I want to acknowledge everyone because they've been around in the lab throughout my whole uh, studies. Uh, of course, the facilities, IGB, Austin, thank you so much. I think you're always there whenever I have questions, so it's great. Uh, I hope that doesn't encourage too much work for you. <laughs> other people asking you questions now. Uh, yeah, and some of the other facilities I've used in campus. Thank you. Oh. And then another question would be, yeah. uh, can you do light 
Yeah, so live imaging, I think one way you could think of doing it is uh, if you have the cells express reporter uh, proteins, like if you just have them express it with GFP and then it gets captured in microgels, you'll be able to see the fluorescence, right? So in a way, it is possible to do it live, uh, but then you'll have to do different types of standardization, and, but it's definitely possible. Uh, as for the question of the gradient, yeah. Uh, so th that's what you're seeing here, right? This this is basically the gradient here of this uh, type of sample. So as you get away the distance from the cell, as you get away from the cell spheroid, your intensity of the capture cytokine decreases, which correlates with the concentration that's being captured. So, yeah, you can form a gradient. I have yeah. a follow-up question yeah. with this part. So, I thought you were taking live imaging, but then I realized it just is not a temporal yeah. uh, line. It's just a, you take a different diameter distance from the cell. Oh, you just measure so the this is signal. Yeah, exactly. Well, so everything has to be fixed. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I guess you can do it while the cells are not fixed. Just introduce the antibodies. I don't know how much I recommend doing that, but uh, yeah, they're, they're fixed, and then it's a one-time uh, experiment. And how do you watch? Do you, can you watch uh, imaging? Yes. Together, yes. How do you watch? Uh, so it's very similar to all the process that you would do in immunostaining. Of course, you do require longer uh, wash steps because they're in like a micro well, they're kind of uh, stuck there. Uh, but with diffusion, it does come out. Uh, you do see some like on the bottoms, sunk down, like maybe if they aggregate it, they'll be on the bottom. But in most cases, like you'll be able to see some clear cut um, fluorescence around the thing. You, you'll wash them out. Yes, so, well, no, I haven't done it. <laughs> I mean, that is a possibility. Uh, we have talked about it in, uh, in our lab. Not you, because uh, <laughs> this is just with me and my PI. <laughs> but we have already talked about it. But uh, I'm kind of done, right? <laughs> I'm out in a year. I'm not gonna do that. Uh, but it is a possibility. It is, as I said, you can do, uh, Differentiating organoid system. Yeah. So basically, you can do that by using the scaffold and then maybe add some of these sensing gels in between so that you'll be able to sense what the uh, ECM effect is under. But there's other ways too, right? You can just get the media out in that case. If you want to really, if you want to see, yeah, if you want to see spatial resolution, sure, do this. But, um, it's more of a bulk thing, Actually, like, yeah. Actually, do like a multi-hyperdimensional microwave system, like I think that, in that, like the immunization would be yeah. altered if cybernectin and fluorescent mode ions mm -hmm. compared to where there was local causes. Yes. So th that was another idea I had before, where you uh, actually tag the different types of ECM-linked microgels with a certain type of fluorophore. Mm -hmm. So you can track which microgel the cell is interacting with, and then maybe see, oh, is it interacting with these two types, then it expresses this. Um, now I kind of got rid of that idea just because the microgels are so small that the cells are gonna be interacting with so many microgels that you can't really quantify it. And also, adding the fluorescent tag gets rid of the fluorescent tag that you use for analysis. So uh, there's different pros and cons, but yeah, definitely uh, mixing and matching the sensors with the ECM linked uh, microgels. Uh, th that's the main advantage of microgels. There's also these other microgels that some other lab have made where it's MMP sensitive. So it will read out MMP cleavage through fluorescence. So even microgels like that can be incorporated in the same system uh, by using this micro Yes? Uh, do you know if these are non linear events or linear events? So 
peg is supposed to be linear and elastic? You might want to know. <laughs> I, I can't really tell you. Um, but yeah, peg is linear. So the cross linkers for um, uh, the, the difference in stiffness here is mainly created by the difference in cross linking density. So in the eight arm, basically one monomer has eight arms of, so it's basically linked to eight things, while the forearm is only linked to four. So the mesh is slightly bigger. You have less amount of the monomer itself here. So this eight percent, this four percent. So that also creates a cross linking density difference. Uh, and and that, that is what's creating the Young's modulus difference, the stiffness difference. But between material properties in terms of this elasticity and like elastic, um, I mean, this is elasticity, but this elasticity. Well, not, I mean, the cells are bigger than their protein, right? But as for how I start the process, they're all the same. So that's my basis on controlling for the and, uh, Any protein that the cells might secrete, if it's hugely different from one type of environment to the other, it's because the environment is disturbing them, right? So and that's all part of the effect that we look at. But as for how that evolution I started, I, So I, when I perform this reaction, I use up most of the uh, normal heat, but there are people that don't. And then those leftover normal means they can use to cross-link the monomer different cells. Um, and for staining, I mean for the microwells, I was still able to stain, right? Because the microwell itself is retaining the structure. That's why for QPC. Oh, okay. Uh, it's very similar to the sensor system where the micro is retaining the structure. Uh, for the QPCR, these were bigger wells, and for that I don't care. I don't care if the structure is. It's just light. Yeah, yeah. I just want to it's light. Just, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, but you could see that I mean you can encapsulate this still in Mexico, so use the those micro the micro as little highways for the cells to grow in. Or you could see where you do your whole cell culture, then maybe stabilize the structure by designing some kind of more porous scale. Uh, not porous scale, like high mesh size, so you can still have that distribution of antibodies. I mean, I mean yeah, you, you can think about the ways to do that, to stabilize the structure. And at, at this stage, of course, the cells are not perfectly stabilizing, but they, they provide some. 